Hey everyone, welcome back. Gonna keep this intro short. You see the title, you see the thumbnail. If you're new to the series, I'll link parts one and two in the description, as well as the original iceberg created by Jimbo Seth. We're continuing layer one, so I hope you guys all enjoy. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have at least heard of the name Edgar Allan Poe at some point in your lives. Poe is a major figure in the world of literature, being known for his poetry and short stories, specifically his tales that revolve around mystery and the macabre. But today, we'll not be focusing on his works during his life, but rather his mysterious death. On a rainy day in Baltimore in October of 1849, a compositor for the Baltimore Sun named Joseph Walker would come across a delirious man dressed in distressed secondhand clothing lying in the filth of a gutter. This man was barely conscious and was unable to move, and as Walker approached this shell of a man, he would discover it was actually the famous poet Edgar Allan Poe. After a brief exchange of words, Poe would give Walker the name of a medical acquaintance in Baltimore which Walker would contact by letter on the same day. Unfortunately, Poe would pass away four days later on October 7th. So the question here is, how did Poe end up in his disheveled state when he was discovered in Baltimore? Before we start theorizing, let's take a quick look at the events leading up to Poe's encounter with Walker. On September 27th, Poe left Virginia for Philadelphia in order to edit a collection of poems for another American poet named Margaret. Poe of course would never reach Philadelphia and his encounter with Walker would be the only time anyone would come across Poe after he departed Virginia. In the four days after Walker found Poe, he would never escape his state of delirium to explain just what had happened to him. Instead, Poe would live out his final days in agonizing fear and fits of hallucinations. However, Edgar Allan Poe would not leave the world before leaving us with a name. Leading up to his last breath, Poe would repeatedly call out for a person named Reynolds. Unfortunately, almost two centuries after his passing, we would still not know who this Reynolds character was. Now let's discuss some theories as to what happened to Poe. One of the first theories to surface was Poe had been beaten to a state of delirium before ultimately passing away. This theory starts by suggesting Poe had angered a woman who then encouraged a group of ruffians to rob and assault Poe. This beating would leave Poe with severe brain injuries which of course led to his final stint in Baltimore. Another theory revolves around a clinical pathologic conference in 1996. Dr. Benitez and other professionals would be instructed to diagnose and compare patients based on their symptoms. Of course, all of these patients would be anonymous during their process. Dr. Benitez would conclude that his patient, which of course turned out to be Poe, had died from rabies. We know that Poe had been exhibiting delirium, hallucinations, shallow breathing, and many more symptoms that are tied with rabies. And in the 19th century, rabies was indeed a fairly common virus to get. However, people who disagree with this theory will point out that most people who get rabies develop a fear of water. And Poe was stated to have been drinking tons and tons of water leading up to his death. Dr. Benitez would also add that if he had known it was Poe prior to his examination, he would have thought, oh yeah, he died of drugs and alcohol. Which leads us to the next theory, drugs and alcohol. Poe was known to not be able to handle his alcohol and before his arrival in Baltimore, Poe was in an event where he had fallen ill as a result of alcohol and his physician advised that another such attack would prove fatal. The theory goes on to say that Poe was seduced by a woman who was trying to swindle him out of his money by encouraging him to drink. This would of course lead him to a drunken stupor which ultimately resulted in his death. As someone who spends a lot of their day on the internet, I often find myself worried that I could have my personal data stolen at any given moment. Luckily, with Atlas VPN, I no longer have to worry about that. I've always put off getting a VPN, thinking that the task would be too complicated to set up. But Atlas has a very easy to understand display, letting you know that your internet traffic is both protected and encrypted. However, this is more than just a VPN. Atlas will block all malicious links, ads, and trackers, plus they will notify you whenever someone is attempting to steal your data. For a limited time, Atlas VPN is offering a huge discount, granting you a 3 year subscription for just $1.99 a month. This is currently the best deal on the market for a top notch VPN service. And just in case you're worried you might not be satisfied with their service, you are also eligible for a 30 day money back guarantee. Furthermore, some of you may be getting bored of the content available on streaming services such as Netflix. When using Atlas VPN to change your digital location, you are greeted with a plethora of new content that is exclusive to other locations. Not 
only that, but you can obtain the best deals when shopping online when utilizing a VPN. Moreover, with only one subscription, you have access to Atlas VPN on unlimited devices. With over 6 million users worldwide, there is no better time to grab yourself Atlas VPN than now. But act fast as $1.99 a month for 3 years offer is not here to stay. Visit my link in the description or in the pinned comment to take advantage of this limited time offer and protect your data today. The Fermi Paradox proposes the following question, where are the aliens? A high percentage of people say that there must be extraterrestrial life out in space, but if that were the case, where are they, and why haven't we had clear and concise evidence of them just yet? This paradox was brought up by one of the greatest physicists of all time, Enrico Fermi. He's probably most well known for creating the first ever nuclear reactor, as well as working on the Manhattan Project. And you may have heard of the following quote by Sir Arthur Clarke. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not, both are equally terrifying. Personally, I think being alone is more terrifying. It would further highlight how rare an event it was for Earth to become inhabitable and for us humans to develop into what we are today. Many experts and speculators would tackle the question proposed by the Fermi Paradox. Unfortunately, Enrico Fermi would pass away four years after introducing us to this paradox, so he wasn't given an opportunity to truly dive into the thought. Personally, I do think there is alien life somewhere out in the universe. It's just that we either haven't looked hard enough or we aren't even capable of such an exploration yet, which is obviously true. We already know how tough it is for a planet such as Earth that is capable of housing life to form. But knowing how infinite the universe is, there has to be another planet that can host intelligent life forms. So long as we don't nuke ourselves into extinction in the next 10-20 million years, we probably should find alien life at some point. Jack the Ripper is one of, if not the most notorious serial killers in history, garnering mass media attention for the brutal nature of the killings, as well as the unrevealed identity of the culprit. And just on the off chance you haven't heard of Jack, or maybe you have and are not comfortable with the graphic details, please skip forward. Jack's victims were typically female workers who resided in the slums of the East End of London. Each of the victims would have their throat cut before having their abdomen and genitals being mutilated as well. Many investigators believe the killers have some level of anatomical or surgical knowledge as three of the victims had their internal organs removed. Due to the large number of attacks against women in the East End during this time, it's tough to tell just how many victims were tied to Jack and how many were killed by other people. There would be 11 murders between April 1888 and February 1891 that would come to be known as the Whitechapel murders. However, opinions would differ if all of these murders were done by Jack, but at the very least, 5 of these 11 would be unanimously agreed upon to have been his work. This group of five victims would be labeled as the Canonical Five. These five people are Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. They would all be connected to Jack due to their throat wounds in addition to the mutilation of their waist areas. Every victim was killed in a very terrible and gruesome way, but Mary Jane Kelly's body was probably the worst mutilated of the group. And this is the final content warning I'm going to provide for this entry, so fast forward about 30 seconds if you don't want to see the body. Kelly's body would be found around 11am on her bed and her face would be destroyed beyond all recognition and her abdomen emptied of essentially all her organs. Her uterus, kidneys, and one breast would be hacked off and placed beneath her head. Over 2,000 people were interviewed, 300 would be investigated, and another 80 would be detained by police in an attempt to find the killer. Most of these suspects were butchers, surgeons, and physicians due to the manner of the killings. Investigators would notice that the killings normally took place around the weekends and public holidays as well as being in close proximity to each other, indicating that the Ripper was likely a regular working man and lived locally. On the other hand, some people believe that the killer was a highly educated upperclassman who made his way into the Whitechapel area from his more well-off location. Everywhere at the End of Time is a 6 hour long recording created by Leyland Kirby that was composed of a bunch of other tracks that he distorted. This record is supposed to simulate what it's like to have dementia. I didn't ever give it a complete listen, but I listened to a few minutes of each part and it definitely paints a solid picture of the word loss. This entry however is referring to the last 5 minutes of the track specifically. Supposedly the last 5 minutes is a sample from another record that Leyland purchased from a record store, but Leyland refused 
refused to say what the record was. As of right now, these are the only details we know of this mysterious record. The sample was recorded in the 60s, only 50 copies were given out to choir members which makes this a private recording, and the reason Leyland won't reveal the details of the record is because he can't. He simply does not know the names associated with the record, and it doesn't help that it's a white label which generally have little to no producer information, simply the music alone. So while the source of the last 5 minutes isn't quite lost media, we have no idea who the original musician is that created the sample record. Fairy circles are circular patches of land that are essentially stripped of plants. These patches typically fall between 7 and 49 feet in diameter and are surrounded by a ring of grass. These circles normally show up in areas that are especially arid and studies show that these circles of grass have a life cycle of about 30 to 60 years. The circular arrangements of grass are an ecological mystery for scientists and have sparked many debates on what causes them. These debates would result in the formation of many different theories, some of which are kind of mundane while others are more supernatural. One theory is that a sand termite is responsible for these patches. In 2012, it was found that 80 to 90% of these circles contain termite casts. However, some people do disagree with this claim, but I couldn't really find legitimate reasoning as to why these termite proposals are false. Instead, these guys would just say that the circles are related to aliens or even gods. But so far, it seems that this entry may be another solved mystery on the iceberg. But there is no recorded footage of termites actually causing these circles, so it's still possible that something else causes them. Hey all, so instead of inserting an ad here, I wanted to take some time and thank you all for the immense support on the channel. It's obviously cliche, and even saying it's cliche is cliche at this point, but thank you guys so, so much. Especially if you've ever left a positive comment, those do more for me than you'd ever realize, and even if you're simply returning to each video and watching, I am very, very grateful for your support. I never thought we'd hit 10,000 plus subscribers in even a year, let alone three months which is absolutely insane. So again, thank you all so much, and I hope I can keep on creating these videos for you all to watch. There are four observed fundamental interactions within physics. These would form the basis for essentially all interactions in nature. They are gravitational, electromagnetic, and both strong and weak forces. However, there are certain events in nature that are hard to fit under these known interactions which has made scientists propose a fifth force. The actual theories as to what this new force is of course vary depending on what anomalous event is being talked about. There are many people who propose this force could roughly have the same strength as gravity but can operate from a much wider scale that can go up to cosmological levels. One theory is derived from the Kaluza-Klein theory, I think is how you say it, which says that electromagnetism and gravitation contribute in forming another dimension beyond the confines of space and time. This is very oversimplified but for the sake of the video that's all you need to know. This theory has prompted people to look into the possibility that this fifth force is from a dimension with a size slightly less than a millimeter. Frank Shaw's gargoyle is a bizarre looking creature reportedly sighted in 1986. Frank Shaw is a NASA employee and one day he would encounter this gargoyle and he wouldn't say very much about it. In fact, he would only tell his daughter the details. In 2004, Frank's daughter Desiree would contact an author named Nick Redfern to recount her father's sighting. She would say that her father arrived home late that night which wasn't an odd occurrence as his work hours regularly ran into the late hours of the night. According to Frank, he was on his way to his car when he glanced upwards to see a ghastly black gargoyle-like figure perched ominously on the edge of one of the space center's buildings. This figure appeared humanoid and had what almost looked like a cape draping over his shoulders. Frank would later realize that this cape was instead its wings and as they were extending, Frank would say they looked similar to wrinkly flesh. This account is said to bear some resemblance to both the Mothman and the Owlman of Cornwall, which are both said to elicit irrational fear to those that see them. So far, you might just be thinking that this is another cryptid story that was made up and you could very well be correct, but this story has a bit more to add. 
Frank Shaw would report what he saw to NASA, and instead of laughing at him, NASA actually sat him down to be interviewed slash interrogated. According to Frank's daughter, NASA had security flown in from Arizona that told Frank and his family that it's in their best interest to not speak of the sighting to anyone else, which could explain why Desiree waited so long to finally tell the story. And one last thing that I'll add on is apparently there was a secret file that the NASA staff had opened on a similar creature in response to the gruesome deaths of two German shepherds. Their corpses were said to be hideously mutilated and were discovered near the area where Frank Shaw first saw the gargoyle. Now, do I think this was real? Absolutely not, but nevertheless, I did find this one pretty entertaining. Questions concerning the nature and true significance of free will have been proposed in every era of philosophy. People such as Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, and many more have touched on this subject. So just to make it clear, free will is traditionally understood to be the power to control one's choices and actions. When someone makes a choice, they are exercising free will, but in what sense? There are typically two answers to this question. One being in the sense that this person is able to choose otherwise and deviate from a choice or act. And then two being in the sense that this person is the source of their action, regardless of what they decide to do. The controversy comes in when deciding whether each of these conditions are required in order to have free will. There are quite a few philosophers and scientists who call free will an illusion created by our minds. Humans are only convinced that they can make conscious decisions, and instead our actions are determined by necessary outcomes of the events that we experienced in the past. The argument that all our decisions are a result of outside influence, and that those decisions were also a result of outside influence from the past that has shaped us into who we are, therefore making all of our decisions not our own. Numerous people have claimed that they have woken in the dark to find a figure looming over them. This figure has been given the moniker of the Hat Man. The Hat Man phenomenon is not a new one. For as long as written records have existed, people have said that they have all encountered the same shadowy man donning a hat when they woke in the middle of the night. This man is said to paralyze the person viewing them as well as leave the viewer short of breath. Sometimes they will even be up close to you and be pressing down on your chest. Many of you may have just thought of sleep paralysis when I described the hat man and while he does indeed seem to be related, why is it that so many people claim to have seen the same exact person? Most people believe it's because our minds like to take and bend things we see from popular culture. Our dreams and nightmares both often put us in situations that highly resemble the real world. Some doctors would say that the idea of the hat man is simply derived from seeing freddy krueger the notion of freddy attacking you in your dreams and of course the top hat are both unique characteristics that a person would remember when watching a famous film that includes freddy then there's the groupthink theory that suggests people aren't actually seeing the same hat man but instead since they can't properly remember what they saw they would just all say they saw the same thing when someone brings up the topic of seeing a shadowy figure at night ultimately convincing themselves that their own sleep paralysis demon was also the the hat man. In 1848, Quartermaster Major Henry Wayne would approach the War Department with a suggestion. Wayne would request to import some camels to the southwest of America to aid the military. It was thought that camels would be an upgrade over horses and mules when it comes to transporting supplies as they can carry at least twice the weight as well as travel without water or rest for much longer. At first, this proposal would be turned down, but in 1854, senators would finally agree to bring in 70 or so camels to the US. But the use of these camels would be short-lived, as soldiers would quickly find out that camels are kind of unpleasant to be around and can oftentimes be found scaring away horses and then wandering off in the middle of the night. So eventually the soldiers would just auction them off or release them into desert areas. In 1883, a woman would be found trampled to death and on her body were clumps of red fur. This would lead to multiple sightings of camels roaming around Arizona. The camel that trampled the woman from earlier would be labeled as the red ghost and would be reported amongst these sightings. Paired with this red camel was the rumor that it was actually carrying around a dead rider. In another account, a group of prospectors would report seeing the red ghost, but something would fall from it. Upon walking up to the dropped object, they would find out it was a skull. So supposedly, this camel is now carrying around a headless corpse roaming around Arizona. In 1893, a farmer in the area would shoot and kill a large camel that was later found to be the red ghost. But unfortunately, there was no corpse or skeleton attached to the camel, only the saddle. 
There are many people who actually believe in the story of the Red Ghost and his headless rider, but if it were true, the question remains, who was this mysterious person and where did the corpse end up? I'm going to keep this entry short since you all know what ghosts are. There isn't clear evidence of their existence, but nevertheless, these spirits have formed a dedicated community that is continuously hunting for answers to the paranormal. In some religions, ghosts are even looked at as demons who come to the surface world to deceive followers of a certain god. Similar to how religions work, every culture also has their own rendition of spirits or ghosts, but oftentimes they are thought to be the remnants of people who are kept away from reaching a peaceful afterlife. Let me know what you guys think of ghosts in the comments below. I know some people are very enthusiastic about their existence. Do you think they're real or are paranormal events just our minds playing tricks on us? Girl from the Main is a nickname given to an unidentified teenage girl who was discovered in the Main River in 2001. And if you are sensitive to topics revolving around abuse, I suggest skipping to the timestamp on the screen. The girl was estimated to be about 15 to 16 years old and was found wrapped in a bedsheet and scarves and tied by the foot to an umbrella stand to weigh her down in the river. Additionally, she was in the water for about 12 to 24 hours but died up to 3 days before she was left there. It was concluded that her death was a result of blunt force trauma which led to broken ribs, a ruptured spleen, as well as punctured lungs. But unfortunately, this was not the extent of her injuries. She had several injuries that recently finished healing, broken bones, burns, and cauliflower ear. Police speculate that this girl is originally from Afghanistan or Pakistan based on her appearance and the scarves that she was found with, but somehow ended up in Germany. And apparently, this is one of the more famous Jane Doe cases in Germany due to the girl's young age and the heavy abuse. And earlier, I forgot to mention, but the girl may also have been malnourished as she weighed in at about 80 to 85 pounds while being 5 foot 2, which is about 20 pounds below average for girls of her age and height. It's tough to begin searching for the culprit as there was little to no DNA or evidence in general that was attached to the girl, but it's thought that the girl arrived in Germany as a servant of sorts. She may have been part of diplomatic circles which would make this case tough to investigate due to political immunity. And I know very little about Middle Eastern culture so take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But there is another theory suggesting that the girl was part of an arranged marriage. In the Middle East, anywhere between 60 to 80% of marriages are arranged marriages. But despite this amount, having a girl so young forced into this is still uncommon, but of course not unheard of. I really found this case interesting due to the lack of information available on it. The sketch you've been seeing was literally the only image I could find involved in this case. As you guys saw from that video, it seems that these two girls saw something that caused them to shriek in fear. At first, it would only be one girl who showed any signs of panic, but after a little while, the other girl would also scream and run to the person recording. But as they went to check out the space where the girls were looking at, there was nothing. So what was it that caused the girls to be so scared? Was it really a ghost? Many people would say that this was a hoax, but the girls' reactions do look genuine in my opinion, and if you search for the video on on YouTube, you will notice that the comment section is turned off, making it impossible for us to get any answers from OP. 
Gloria Ramirez was a woman from Riverside, California who was given the nickname the Toxic Lady when a number of hospital workers would get sick after being exposed to her body and blood. Gloria was sent to the emergency department while suffering from late stage cervical cancer and while she was being treated, several hospital workers would suddenly faint while others would experience muscle spasms and shortness of breath. Five of these workers would need to be hospitalized and unfortunately Gloria would pass away from kidney failure shortly after arriving at the hospital. At first this case was thought to be a result of mass hysteria by the workers but after an investigation by the LLNL it was proposed that Gloria may have been self-administering dimethyl sulfoxide to treat her pain. And when Gloria was defibrillated at the hospital the dimethyl sulfoxide would convert into dimethyl sulfate which is an extremely poisonous substance. Shortly after Gloria was defibrillated, some workers would notice that Gloria's skin developed an oily sheen and was emitting a fruity garlic-like odor. Nurse Susan Kane would draw blood from Gloria and reported that it gave an ammonia-like smell. Susan would also notice that the blood had manila-colored particles floating around and of course Susan would begin feeling nauseous at this point and had to go to the trauma room. So what happened? As I said earlier, media outlets thought this was a case of mass hysteria from the medical staff, but after interviewing 34 hospital workers, they all denied being a affected by mass hysteria and many of them would point to their own medical history as evidence. Livermore Labs aka LLNL theorized that the dimethyl sulfoxide built up in Gloria may have led to urinary blockage which caused a kidney failure. And the temperature change when Gloria's blood was being drawn may have caused the conversion into dimethyl sulfate. However, the scientists at Livermore Labs were not 100% confident this is what happened. And Gloria's family would enthusiastically argue against the sulfoxide being the reason for her death. That's going to end part 3 for this series on the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg and apologies for having this one be shorter than the rest. I do like to have these videos run for at least 40 minutes or so. Um, unfortunately, I do have some IRL things that require my attention, but the next videos should fall back into that 40 minute plus runtime again. If you enjoyed the video, leaving a like would really help me out and if you're new and want to join us as we explore this iceberg, hit the subscribe button. All that being said, thank you all so much for your time and I'll talk to you all again very soon.